video up uh, through. I begin to see my friend, Dr. Christopher Brummer, professor at Georgetown University and the leading force behind FinTech Week, uh, which is really not just the Washington DC, but fundamentally the global week uh, par excellence, the one seed of all fi FinTech uh, gatherings in the nation's capital and other places. Uh, Dr. Brummer, welcome. Uh, I see Margaret Liu. Margaret is the uh, Senior Vice President and the General Counsel of the Conference of State Bank Supervisors. These are the folks that regulate lots of the payment system and all of the state banks, state credit unions, state chartered other institutions throughout the country. They play a critical role in this regulatory system and we're, we're thrilled to have you in your voice there. Uh, I see Mike Calhoun. Mike is the president for the Center for Responsible Lending, uh, one of the leading consumer advocate organizations and affiliate of Self-Help Credit Union. Uh, Mike, uh, one of the be many benefits of CRL is they take positions based not just on uh, ideological theory, but on their practical experience of their affiliated credit union, helping millions of low income and moderate individuals achieve a fairer and better outcome in financial services and hence in life. Uh, and last but not least, I wanna introduce Greg Baer from the Bank Policy Institute, the president CEO founding driving force, former president of the Clearinghouse. I would note that BPI provides generous support to Brookings, which helped make the work we do possible. And I'd also reiterate Brookings commitment to independence and underscore the views today expressed are solely those of the various speakers uh, myself in, included. So can I virtually say hello to everybody and ask everybody to say hello to the universe? Uh, hello, universe. Hello. <laughs> hello uh, great. Everyone. great. Well, let's, uh, let's start by reacting. Uh, what was the biggest thing uh, Brian said where you thought he got it right? What do you take issue with? Um, Chris, why don't we start with you and we'll go around uh, in the order I introduce folks. So, so I, you know, I, I thought it was, you know, a really fascinating conversation because what you're really seeing is, is Brian taking a step back and trying to situate mm -hmm. some of the conversations that we have now within the sort of overall uh, question about what is banking, you know, and, and what is a bank? And, you know, from a historical standpoint, you know, what, you know, the, the idea of what is a bank, it, it is remarkably complex and consistent at the same time. And you know he identified a couple of the uh, key aspects of of banking. Um, you know I, I would I would add that one that he's recently acknowledged, particularly in the context of of crypto assets, would be sort of the the role of a bank as safeguarding assets as well, not just the deposit taking and and, and the like. And we can have a conversation about that now or later on stable coins or whatever. Um, but he's trying to sort of figure out, okay, how can I put this in this larger conversation of banking, which is a departure of sorts from the normal conversation that 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 we're having. And then from that, taking it, and linking the concept of banking to the concept of intermediation, right? Because I think that's where he's going to get the most pushback and the most sort of friction about, well, how broad is the concept of, of, of intermediation? Um, and, you know, does this, does it, does sort of this definition of the bank end up uh, biting off more or, uh, than, than it can chew? And we can get into to that, but I, I, I really want to also listen to uh, my other panelists and, and, Maybe from there we can have a dialogue. Aaron, should I jump in now? Okay, great. Um, well, and, and thank you very much for, for convening this. And I'm really honored to be on this panel with uh, so many talented and thoughtful people. Um, so, you know, I think that one of the starting places for us in terms of what is a bank um, is really what Congress has said a bank should be. And, I, and Aaron, I know you brought this up in your conversation as opposed to what the OCC says a bank should be. You know, Professor Brummer um, really rightly noted the complexities um, of what it means to be a bank in terms of the volumes and volumes of, of case law and, and legal thought. And, you know, uh, for, you know, over 100, 150, um, 200 years almost. Um, and so I think it's a little bit simplistic to just say, you know, well, we issued a regulation um, that says a bank can be in lending payments or taking deposits because it's not really as simple as that. And that's really the basis of our lawsuit um, and the lawsuit that DFS has pursued. 
And um, to, you know, if you look back at the history, um, payments and lending were definitely always part of what it meant to be a bank but so was deposit taking. And I think that there's a really strong argument and case law and, and legal scholarship to back up the idea that to lend or to take payments requires taking deposits. Um, I won't bore you or our audience with dramatic readings from um, any of the legal briefs that are being prepared or just issued. Um, but I think suffice it to say that there is a, um, from our standpoint, it's quite clear that you have to take deposits to be a bank. Um, you know, the, the acting comptroller also brought up some case law around um, additional bank powers, what, what you might think of as sort of the, the outer limits. Um, but I think it's important to not confuse that with what we're really talking about here with regard to the FinTech Charter, which are the um, inner limits, I guess, is, is a term if you think about it, just, just a contrast. You know, these aren't about expanded powers um, that banks uh, might or might not be able to pursue, but this is about the foundation of what it means to be a bank and really about who gets to decide what it means to be a bank. Yeah, I'll go, I mean, I agree with Margaret, I was gonna make a similar point about, it's, it's one thing to say banks should be able to engage and can engage in data processing. It's another thing to say that a data processor is a bank. Um, you know, you have to have certain core attributes in order to be a bank. And you know, picking up, I won't talk about the law as much, but I mean, I think there are particular reasons not to unbundle, and I, I do think it's a wonderful way to think about it. I get my credit for phrasing it as such. Unbundle payments from other uh, banking activities, you know, regardless of what the law may be. I mean, if you are a payment system operator, you're going to have a lot of idle cash lying around, and the history of that is that you tend to invest it in high yielding illiquid assets, and you are prone to runs and trouble. Um, and I think that's why it's a very good thing to have, bund you know, to have bundled payment operation with things like access to the discount window, insured deposits, um, you know, Fed supervision, all kinds of things like that. So it's not by accident. It's a good idea to put those things together, not to take them apart. Um, I think the, the biggest surprise um, from the remarks was, you know, perhaps his lack of awareness that we actually have a real-time payment system in this country. Um, which uh, as a former clearinghouse person I'm well aware of, um, it's not hypothetical, it's operating right now. I think now over 50% of DDAs in the United States um, are eligible for real-time payments by the end of the year, I think. It's direct, direct debit accounts, is that what you Yeah, we, yeah deposit. demand deposit accounts. So re regular old checking accounts as you think about it. Um, by the end of the year it should be 80%. Um, originally the, the, the original adapters were the large banks that spent billions to build the system. Uh, but now through the core processors like Jack Henry, they're bringing on small banks. I think Jack Henry is adding 20 to 25 a month at this point. There was a delay in the small banks coming on board because as you note, the Fed sort of said, well, wait, we're gonna build one too. But I think at this point, people are not willing to wait and they're joining up and that's a good thing. And you know, to use Brian's phrase, this is not built on 1910 rails or any old rails. These are entirely new rails. In fact, the same rails that the Singapore and Australian and, uh, and British system are, are built on with rich data capability as well as the payments. Um, and you know, the benefits in, you know, Aaron, you've talked about this um, are extraordinary because you, know, you basically take fraud risk to zero because these are credit uh, push, not debit pull systems. So someone has to actually authorize the payment. And so it can be final and irrevocable and immediate. Um, so that's gonna end up being a massive benefit, not just corporate America, but consumer America. So you know, I, I think there's a lot more hope there and, and expectation. and. To the extent that you believe that's working, um, then I think there's a whole lot less need to sort of reinvent the National Bank Act. Mike, what do you think of Brian's remarks? Let me add a couple of comments to those that have been made. The first is we support faster payments and through a variety of ways. So consumers benefit from that. Uh, there would be two things I would note. I would, first, following on other speakers, it does seem like this is an attempt to pretty heavily shoehorn payment processors into the existing bank charter uh, structure. Uh, and you, we heard a couple of things where Congress did talk in terms of banks as insured depositories, the Bank Holding Company Act, uh, but also from a consumer standpoint, he, uh, Brian made some reference to this, uh, the CRA only, Community Reinvestment Act, only applies to insured depositories. Now, it's what the OCC is talking about doing is putting a light version, as he talked about it, 
over that to try and replace that gap, but it doesn't have assessment areas, which are based upon deposit taking. Uh, it doesn't have community input requirements. It is very much uh, a very light version of CRA. And then perhaps most recently, Congress, I think, reflected its view that when it talked about banks, it was meaning insured depositories. And that's in Dodd-Frank and the CFPB. If you look at the areas of coverage of the CFPB authority vis-a-vis -vis other regulators, it is carved out in terms of are they insured depositories. So for example, uh, it starts out with CFPB for larger participants has exclusive consumer protection authority over them, except in the case of insured depositories, where for those above 10 billion, it has primary and below 10 billion, it has uh, uh, joint with the prudential regulator having primary. And so that both reflects, I think, a statutory history and also uh, raises just a very pragmatic enforcement problem. Uh, if these are over 10 billion, does the OCC have any consumer authority? I would argue under the CFPB language, probably not. That doesn't seem like necessarily a, a great arrangement. And then the final point is there is some, uh, I think, assumption of, of, of uh, fintech and, and modernization means better consumer uh, uh, result. And I would submit that, you know, sort of fintech 1.0 was debit card companies, uh, prepaid debit card companies coming in and offering an alternative, circumventing bank direct deposit, uh, uh, de demand deposit accounts. But what we saw very quickly was not that they uh, eliminated the abuses that we're all talking about trying to uh, get to with faster payments. Instead, immediately, they recognized that the profit centers were overdraft fees and high cost credit and added both of those features as major revenue sources to what was a prepaid debit card for safe, you know, faster transmission of money. And, and we, we worry very much, particularly with the preemption that comes, that, there, that you need to have a robust consumer protection regime in place. We've seen the Wild West uh, and it doesn't come out well. And I think that will be the case. You know, payment processors are gonna realize that gets commoditized very quickly and does not generate the returns that shareholders want. Uh, that the money, once again, will be in these ancillary services that will start out uh, very poorly regulated. So, Mike, Mike I, I couldn't agree with you more uh, on almost everything, particularly on overdrafts. I alluded to Wood Forest National Bank. I didn't, never want to give the names of banks in front of the comptroller, but Wood Forest National Bank uh, uh, is number three on the list of banks that get most of their money on overdraft. Uh, just ahead of Armed Forces Bank, which gets 87% of its profit from overdraft. Wood Forest is the one in, in the Walmarts. Armed Forces preys on servicemen and women. Um, and it's, it, it, uh, Margaret, I, I, I wonder from a state banking perspective, whether an entity that gets 50 to 80 to 112% of their profits from overdraft, is that really a bank charter or a check cashing charter? Uh, and if it were a check casher, it'd have to charge less. Um, but, but, and, and Mike, I, I would wish that all deposit insured depository institutions were subject to the CRA. Credit unions are exempt as an insured depository institution. So, uh, alas, there are some. Uh, I've written that that's a, a a mistake, particularly as you see credit unions who whose uh, service mantra is um, uh, everybody's welcome. Uh, but. Uh, once upon a time, there was something called field of membership that was enforced. Um, I want to I want to go to 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 a comment Greg raised and, and a question that I asked the controller that I want to ask each of you, uh, which is there is there is a way to get people their money immediately, either using the real time payment system, um, or requiring under the expedited funds availability act that the money be made av 
available immediately. Um, two, two, two questions. If you were in charge of the, the, the stimulus payments, how would you get the money out to folks? And if you could write the law, would you move the Expedited Funds Availability Act up so that people would have access to their money uh, immediately? Um, Greg, why don't we, we, we start with you and we'll work backwards in, in, in the other uh, order. And end with sure. I mean, I don't know if it's possible in these time frames, but I mean, Treasury could have adopted and could now adopt real-time payments. Instead, they they have a no-bid contract with the Fed to do ACH, but they could work with the clearinghouse and be, be making real-time payments at least for those, um, you know, citizens who actually have a an account at a bank that qualifies. I mean, obviously, the next as you sort of go down the line, the next option is ACH, um, which they did. Um, you know, I think they have a potential in the future to deal more with the industry. There's something called early warning system, which has a great database that would allow them to more closely link folks with accounts and, and thereby reduce the number of rejects, which ends up in a paper check. So I think next time around, they probably will work with them, which could substantially increase the number of ACH payments versus um, paper check payments. And then of course, you know, your last recourse is paper check, which is not great. Um, you know, in terms of availability, I mean, you know, I, I think you gave a little bit of history. I mean, Treasury issued their payment instructions on, on Friday, but the money did not go to the banks until Wednesday. And then the money went from the banks to the recipients on Wednesday. So it was the same day. Um, you know, so I, I don't see why that can't happen. I mean, in fact, the banking industry asked for it to happen on Monday in order to avoid conversations like this for whatever technical reasons they didn't, they weren't able to do that. Um, you know, but I assume next time that'll go a little more smoothly. I would say though, I mean, in terms of, you know, funds availability more general, generally, I mean, there is a reason that the payments are delayed and, and it's fraud, um, which is massive. Um, and, you know, with regard even to the stimulus checks, you know, there were concerns about revoked deposit capture and how you could, you know, double deposit checks, which I think happened. Um, and then, you know, just plain fraud, counterfeit, so, I mean, I think banks, you know, do need to take a moment, particularly with non, you know, Treasury Department checks, um, to make sure that, in fact, this is, you are who you say you are, and it's a legitimate payment. And, and Aaron, just to clarify your question as for, all, I think, all of us, are you specifically thinking about sort of PPP functionalities, or are you thinking about the, the stimulus? I'm thinking about the direct payments to individuals, not, okay. not, not the gifts to small business, quote, unquote, small businesses. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about the twelve to thirty-four hundred dollars. If a family of four got a thirty-four hundred dollar check in the city of Miami, they could wait many days for that check to be available, or go to a check cashier at a cost of one hundred two dollars. Those were their two choices. Uh, in Maryland, I think the check cashier fee is is closer to to two percent. Mike, what what do you what do you think? Clearly, the faster uh, we do as a uh, the Depository institution uh, have appreciation on the need for uh, fraud review, uh, particularly third party checks. Uh, I think the bigger issue, I mean, it'd be great if people get them three days earlier, although this is not the check that people were counting on this, but it's not like their regular paycheck, uh, hopefully, although the first ones were because of unemployment and the delay people getting unemployment benefits and we may have a taste of that again with the delay in unemployment benefits i think the people who were hurt the most were you know there were folks getting checks just recently uh, the paper sending out paper checks from treasury you know they were sending the last of those out in mid-july um, and to me if, if you that would be the first place to focus resources where people are delayed literally for months not a few days Margaret, what do you think? I, th I think certainly um, with the, you know, we're, we're in an extraordinary unprecedented time now and um, getting people um, the stimulus payments sooner, um, you know, is, is I think important um, and certainly would be constructive. I think the, the broader question that you raise, Aaron, it is the, is the tougher one, um, you know, and I, and I don't have a lot to add uh, beyond what um, Greg said, uh, but, but I do think that it also does um, you know, the, the, the idea of the paper checks going out in May um, it invites the broader question that I can't remember maybe, you know, Mike mentioned um, and maybe taking us back to the FinTech topic. Um, 
you know, FinTech's promise in terms of um, inclusion, I think, is uh, still a, a work in progress, uh, something that we're not going to really solve today. But I think that this is an area, actually, as I was, you know, preparing for this, I was looking for, um, you know, scholarship and, and research on this. And, um, and I think there's, uh, there, there's not a, a lot um, yet uh, that, that really proves what FinTech has done um, you know, ha has not done. Um, I, certainly, you know, the opportunity is there. Yeah, uh, it, it, tr that is absolutely true. It's something that I uh, tell all of my colleagues all the time, in fact, uh, that, that and, and my students, that this is one of those STEM areas of the law. You know, obviously a lot of the financial technology is new, and so people are still trying to um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll call it real-time scholarship can be a little bit difficult because you're trying to accumulate and assess as much data as, as, as you can get your hands on. But, you know, I, I would say that, you know, I think it's clear that you want to get the money to people as quickly as, as, as you can. Um, a lot of the challenges that we saw earlier wasn't just, uh, however, the, the, the problem of, of the speed when you think about some of the most vulnerable people in society, it's also about having a digital identity and a bank account in the first place. And so it, it's not just if you have an account, how do you move the money to that account? It's, it's what then if people don't have an account, you know, what are the kinds of tools that you can use to still get money to people who may need them? And again, they're, they're more likely to be the most vulnerable in society. Um, and I think that that's a critical question that still needs to be worked out. And I think it's one where again, FinTech solutions can be really interesting. The other thing is, you know, and also relating to fintech has to do with the, um, you know, treasury wasn't the only problem uh, uh, when it, when it comes when it came to, to moving money and even outside the PPP uh, space at the state level, how do you move money and get resources to people who um, are relying on different forms of uh, public assistance and, and, you know, that's one of those undercovered stories. Um, and it is more challenging because you have to go on a state by state and sometimes city to city basis, but it's a critical part of trying to think through uh, the movement of money for purposes um, or, or for scenarios like we saw and that we're seeing uh, in the, uh, during the pandemic, which is how do you get money again, not just to people, but to the people who need it most and uh, most quickly. And, and I think that um, you know, real-time uh, payments, it's, it's, it's obviously a, a critical aspect, but it's, it's not the entire solution. No, I, that's, that's exactly, exactly right. And time is real money. I'm always reminded, we talk a lot about the 6.5% of Americans who are unbanked and deservedly so. We don't talk nearly as much about the 8% of Americans who spend $300 a year or more on overdraft. Uh, which, you know, is part of the reason why it's so expensive to be poor. Uh, more American families are paying $300 a year or more for overdraft than don't have a bank account. Um, or hey, let me Aaron. Ask Although, Aaron, I, I, I guess I, I'd add there. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I agree with you. A, a bank that's getting 80% of its income from overdrafts, that, that's a problem. <laughs> getting 80% of its income from anything, but certainly overdraft. Um, you know, but... but, but well, no, I'll let somebody else go. So Aaron, um, could I go back to one of the other comments that the acting comptroller made? Um, and, and you know, I know that you have a lot of topics you want us to cover, but one of the other things that I think, um, you know, can't go without some, um, you know, correcting of the record uh, is the, the suggestion that, um, you know, uh, all responsible and real regulation ends at the borders of the National Bank Charter. Um, you know, and, and obviously, you know, working, you know, with and on behalf of state regulators, um, I see um, the, the world that the states regulate, um, you know, kind of the, the here and now in terms of, you know, kind of very practical focused on on the ground local accountability, um, a consumer focus um, there. And, and so, you know, to, to suggest that, you know, it, it's either, you know, regulation by the OCC or there's no regulation, I think really misses the point that we have. Um, we have a regulatory ecosystem um, in this country and, and the states um, are a piece of that by, by design. Um, you know, and, and I think that his ex ante comment aside, you know, there's a reason why there are limits to what Congress can do and, um, you know, everything else is delegated to the states. Uh, this is not to say that there isn't work to make uh, state supervision more networked, um, more consistent. Um, this is a long game that the states have been involved in for a long time in terms of looking for technology tools, model laws um, to make our work 
more integrated, more coordinated, um, and more networked uh, to, to meet, you know, innovation and to respond to, you know, the, the, the pace um, of innovation. So, Margaret, but, oh, go ahead, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, you go. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, no, no, I, I, I think it, you know, right now, aside for the moment about, you know, uh, the, the specific legal question, I think that as a matter, you know, um, uh, and Margaret's bringing up a wonderful and, and very interesting point uh, that I think sometimes gets, gets a little bit overlooked, which is it's not all, I think that the case for, for federal regulation, particularly for FinTech and for electronic services, there's a strong case, right? Because a lot of these uh, businesses, rely on their ability to scale, right? And so, you know, the more scale you get, then, you know, you maybe you can drive down costs and, and, and under proper supervision, pass them on to your customers. I got that. But there's also like a really interesting case that people forget about like, you know, particularly in this age, you know, what is it, what's the competitive advantage then of, of states? And I think it would be great to have that a little bit more in the conversation because states generally um, may not have the, 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 the scale, right? But they do tend to have the scope, particularly when you think about something like New York, right, where where you have both banking and insurance and other kinds of powers kind of wrapped up in, in one particular entity. You can actually experiment in, in broader ways that's currently possible at the federal level, right? So, you know, at the federal level, you have, uh, as we see with many of the things that the OCC is doing, you know, there has to be buy-in by uh, the Fed. There has to be buy-in by the FDIC. There has to be um, a kind of there is for lots of different reasons, a different kind of sort of siloed model when it comes to regulation that sometimes isn't really the case over at the states. And it, and it makes for, you know, interesting policymaking and experimentation beyond just sort of this hackneyed term of, you know, the 50 states model of, of experimentation. They can just kind of do things um, when they choose to. They can do things in ways that are at, at times more interesting than, than, than the federal level. Part of the, the the policy conversation, not not the legal conversation, but part of the policy conversation that I would invite, you know, these, uh, you know, the uh, Brookings of the world and the other institutions to sort of think about, and the BPIs is sort of where does that competitive advantage lie, right, between the the states and and the federal level, particularly when you start to get new kinds of models and, and different kinds of financial uh, technologies. I say, Aaron, I think you made an interesting point, which is, I mean. Congress could pass a federal money transmitter license, just the way they could do a federal insurance charter. They have chosen not to, um, and you know. But until they do, I mean, I don't think the answer is basically to try to shoehorn that into the national bank system as the business of banking, um, which is really. And I think you made this point as well. A lot of this is really, you know, the elephant in the chat room is this is about banking and commerce, right? I mean, I mean, I think the acting controller gave the example of PayPal, and we're all like, oh yeah, sure, yeah. That's, but I mean, there's no limiting principle. I mean, if, if it's not an insured depository institution and, and therefore not a bank holding company subsidiary, um, it, it could be, I mean, you know, there's another chat going on today on the Hill, but any of those companies that everybody's watching instead of us, I have big hubs for the tape uh, delay, but um, any of those companies could have a money transfer license. And you know, how do we feel about that? Um, and just do the payment system through a national bank charter um, you know, without taking insured deposits and running their regular businesses and doing whatever they want with that cash. So, I mean, I think that's the larger question, which I think you were quite sharp to get to. No, I, Greg, you're entirely right. I was uh, uh, doing something once and, and somebody offered to pay me uh, in an Amazon gift card. And you know what, like, you know, especially this was pre-COVID, but post-COVID, uh, I buy a lot of stuff there. And you can imagine that payment ecosystem you know, does that raise real questions? And on a consumer protection standpoint, I want to bring in Mike because PayPal is suing the CFPB to get out of the requirement that my PayPal wallet be treated like my other digital funds and to create a schism so that sending money on PayPal has does not have a level playing field in consumer protection, depending on whether it's from my bank insured debit account or my PayPal account. Uh, the acting comptroller said he was for a level playing field in one area I wonder if that would translate over to here. And the other aspect on consumer protection and payments, and this relates to something you said, Margaret, is, you know, there are a lot of shady payment operators operating in multiple states. And if your state AG isn't aggressive in doing that, you know, good luck. A Northern, look at Northern Lease Financing, a, a convicted fraudster from multiple companies who just made a settlement in New York State, but was down here in my hometown of Silver Spring, Maryland, ripping off small businesses. 
And when the small businesses went to the state AG, they did one of these little things. Oh, well, this is a business agreement. Oh, but as a personal guarantee, Mike, they were using your favorite tactic of default judgments against small business owners directly in court. I mean, ruining people's lives. You should look on this Northern Leasing Sucks Facebook chat uh, about what this company did to people, small, good small business entrepreneurs through these loopholes in payment services regulation. And it's great that New York did something, Margaret, but I mean, Maryland, I, I thought we had a great AG. And good Lord, did he do nothing when Maryland businesses were getting ripped off. So Mike, how do you make sense of this from a consumer advocate and consumer protection standpoint? I think our consistent position is you need a strong floor uh, of federal protections. Uh, and if you have that, it works in, and quite frankly, you don't for most institutions need preemption. I think one that surprises people is you know, truth in lending, which everyone takes as a prescriptive uh, 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 program, is not preemptive. I mean, states, I think one actually at one point did have extra disclosures. They have to be uh, consistent with the, with the baseline. But you saw that that worked. And then I think we had a second demonstration of that with the Dodd-Frank bill and the mortgage protections um, that prior to the passage of the mortgage protections in Dodd-Frank, there were, and we had been deeply involved with them. I think at one point there were more than 30 state laws uh, on different mortgage protections, particularly on high cost loans. Uh, that stopped with the passage of a strong floor of protections uh, in Dodd-Frank, which again are explicitly not preemptive. Uh, you know, states have plenty of things to do. If there's a regulatory scheme that works pretty well, uh, they tend to move on to other things. And also people do want access to credit and you don't win a lot of votes locally unnecessarily, unnecessarily restricting people's access to credit. So I think we've seen repeatedly that that model works quite well. So, well let me, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Aaron. I, I was just gonna say we're, we're running uh, almost to, to the, uh, towards the end of our time um, and, and I, I was going to ask one more question and then kind of move on, which is that um, per Mike's comment about, about um, good accounts, there've been a lot of progress that, that uh, banks have made. The FDIC has a model account, a safe account, um, which has been replicated by some smaller entities like Bank On, Citibank and their city access accounts have been remarkably uh, successful in terms of a large percentage of, of new accounts, uh, as well as uh, more reasonable access to small dollar credit in, in better, more sustainable terms. I know U.S. Bank has a simple loan program that uh, they've rolled out. Uh, and so, you know, I, I kind of wanted to ask folks, you know, part of payments and part of the ramifications of having a bad payment system are these high costs. And part of the solution is bringing people into a, into a banking system with better payment services that, that service their needs. So I wanted to ask folks, you know, what do they think about some of the solutions that are out there already existing? Uh, and where do we need more new ideas or new, is, is it a problem of infrastructure? Is it a problem of product? Is it a problem of delivery? Or is it a problem of uh, predators having too high an existing market share and, and moving folk? Or is it something else? Yeah, I mean. Greg, what do you think? I mean, Aaron, I mean. Getting back to what we were saying earlier, I mean, I think one of the great lessons of the experience the Treasury had in trying to send money to people, I think a lot of us are just shocked at how many people don't have bank accounts. Um, and, you know, and, you know I, I understand the criticism of overdrafts, but the people who don't have bank accounts, I mean, they're not paying overdrafts, they're, they're paying check cashing fees, um, which put, you know, overdrafts to shame. I mean, so I, I think it's a, it's a massive challenge, and I, I think it's an important challenge to try to get as many people into the regulated insured depository institution banking system as we possibly can. I mean, I, I think it's great that there are more simple loan products out there. Um, I also think it's good that there's competition here. I mean, you know, we, we work with a lot of banks and, you know, sometimes they don't even want to share what they're up to because they, they want to win, right? I mean, that's good. And I think the fact that you see variation in overdraft protections um, and, and overdraft practices um, indicates that there's actually a market um, where consumers are now, I think maybe they didn't used to be, but I think now are sufficiently informed that they're making rational choices 
about whether to opt in or out of various things and, and how to choose their accounts. So, you know, I think anything, you know, the FDIC, I think was, I think was a helpful exercise. Um, you know, on the small dollar lending product, we just had the CFPB, and I think we worked with a lot of consumer advocates, just approved a, a sort of small dollar lending template that we had sought sort of a safe harbor for. Um, you know, we're hoping banks will take that up. Obviously, we can't make them. Um, and it, but it was not terribly dissimilar from some of the products that a few of our banks were already offering. So whether it's on the deposit side, getting folks in, or whether once in, we get them a small dollar lending product so they don't have to go back outside the banking system to get credit. I mean, I, I think that's a, a, a moral imperative. So I, I, I would say we, we have a challenge though, that these are not competitive markets and there's overwhelming evidence uh, to show that dysfunction. Uh, if you look at overdraft fees, uh, for example, the level of overdraft fees has steadily, the, the cost per fee is totally untethered to what the consumer pays to the cost to the bank. And it is increased as technology has driven down uh, the cost uh, where you're, no one's manually comparing uh, the checks and the accounts. It's a fully automated system plug and play uh, on a commission basis from a lot of the financial service providers. And unfortunately, the history was much the same with small dollar lending, although some of the new programs show much more project uh, uh, promise. We had direct deposit advance where the average APR was over 250%. This was a bank product. And the average borrower was getting 19 of these once in a blue moon loans per year because they were being flipped over and over again. And once again, the cost structure for the bank was a fraction, maybe a 10th of what it was for the storefront payday lender, but that was their competitor. And a lot of that has to do with the inherent stickiness and unmovability of the basic account, particularly for lower wealth households. I mean, I would ask how many people in this conversation have moved their bank accounts, closed them at one bank and moved your primary bank account to another institution. It is a horrendous process and it requires a substantial amount of float to pull it off. And so most people, when they pick a bank account are not shopping based on what the fee for a small loan will be, what the fee for an overdraft will be, and so it is a captive market. I mean, one, one private equity firm in another context described it as like having a Waffle House except the customers are chained to the booths. And I think that applies for low income bank accounts that customers are chained to those accounts and uh, th there's not competition and their immense revenues is, is Eric. Aaron has uh, pointed out in our studies, we released one recently updated accounts. Uh, the, you know, we've turned the market almost on its head where lower wealth account holders are subsidizing the accounts of our higher wealth uh, uh, account holders. And I even had one prominent uh, bank general counsel argue at the time that if we don't have overdraft, we can't offer our higher balance accounts free checking we need the subsidy of all that overdraft money coming in that that should not be how our system runs today yeah, yeah j just to, to to jump in there because you know it, it's interesting i thought our conversation was was going to um uh i thought that given having uh the acting comptroller here that much of that converse of our conversation would really sort of focus on all the different sort of areas of of uh, fintech that he's also um, thinking about and and uh, it is it is vast. Um, you know what I think we've seen in the pandemic was you know the challenges of onboarding new customers, right? You know for all the advances in customer facing um, technology, uh, we've seen at, with some of our legacy banks, right? You know not the fastest implementation um, and incorporation of the kinds of tools one would have normally expected or, or hoped to see. And, and, and that in and of itself, you know, it 
for the PPP purposes. It, it creates challenges for onboarding new uh, small businesses. But but when it comes to the question of individuals and their their exit opportunities from financial institutions that are not serving them well, right? It it, it helps to trap them in like a little bit of a of a lobster trap, right? Uh, or a waffle. I have to remember the the Waffle House analogy, and um, and I think that and, and this is to the to the you know, to the credit of uh, fintech firms, particularly those kinds of firms that are sort of native to digital uh, technology, they have sort of existentially built many of those KYC, AML, um, customer facing uh, onboarding um, automation tools into their business strategy, right? And and, and that is, is something that I think um, it ultimately helps to, to give you know, in, in its truest sense, customers more more choice in the sense of being able to exit these kinds of sort of predatory relationships that they sometimes have with their financial institutions. So if you're going to ask me, you know, what can be done to sort of better service and better serve um, uh, uh, everyone, including uh, those who are less um, uh, fortunate and, and also the most uh, vulnerable, you know, you, we really have to have a conversation about digital identities. We have to have conversations about onboarding tools. We have to have conversations about digital infrastructure and, 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 and data for the purposes of um, uh, uh, KYC AML. And, and then we get into also conversations because of just, you know, when you're building out your, your infrastructure, how does that then apply to lending when you can use alternative data um, to sort of uh, lower and reduce um, uh, potentially the, the, the loans people can access? You know, you know, I think that the overdraft fee issue is an enormous one. It's one that will also play itself out with conversations on usury law and, and other kinds of things we haven't um, had, had the, the, the opportunity to, to, to get into. But, you know, that conversation and as to the net cost of my banking relationship, right? That is a, a conversation that happens uh, in, in, that has to be taken uh, not, not only on a sort of individual basis, but you really have to look at what are, what are the suite of services and what are the suite of costs and benefits um, that are being applied. Because I think that's where, from a policy standpoint, we're gonna start to uh, move the conversation to, to really get uh, into a policy that, that moves people into uh, a, a better banking experience. So Chris, I, I think it's really important because you know, AML issues drive up the costs of banking. Yeah. Of the 6.5 per, the 8 million households without bank accounts, you have 2.4 million, I believe is, is the estimate, who are on this do not bank list. And so by in reducing the cost of AML compliance, you really address, I mean, you know, you have 20 to 30% of the unbanked are on a do not bank list. This, putting a bank in a post office, unless you're gonna exempt them from AML, doesn't even begin to address this problem. What does address this problem is the legislation working its way through Congress on beneficial ownership. Um, I see, I see uh, both Greg and and, and Mike being happy about that, which ought to tell you the broad basis of support this thing has. Uh, who would have thought the National Defense Authorization Act on beneficial <laughs> way to uh, better serve the unbanked? But it sounded like, gentlemen, from, from from both of your reactions, you think this is a win for consumers. Um, I, I'd I'd also want to 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 also point out, Chris, a lot of what you're saying about digital identity and the rest of this stuff doesn't that fundamentally argue towards economies of scale? in terms of better understanding this. I mean, it's, it's somewhat telling, you know, I wanna get away from the overdraft comments, but like those are all these really little banks that just have this niche market on one little thing. In the broader economies of scale world, where you can get cheaper at, uh, situations, where you have investment in building an alternative payments. I mean, I feel like I'm stuck at this Waffle House with, with, with the ACH system. I mean, how do I as a consumer get out? I want off of ACH. There are a lot better alternatives in the world, but I feel like I'm trapped, right? Why does the government have to send me this money and why do I have to wait so long for it? Uh, you know, what, what, what are the ways to change this paradigm? Well, I mean, besides the fact that, yeah, for the record, I don't care what people say, the hash browns over at Waffle House can be Sometimes quite. Good. I am a fan too. I just. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean for, for, besides the, the, you know, I, I will, I will take for the moment and bracket the, the conversation on Waffle House in, in particular. 
to 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 say that I, I think there's an economy of scale argument, but I think that there's also an automation um, uh, element to it as, as well. Like I mean, to the extent to which you can create some kind of secure uh, program based off of a digital I identity, right? And that in some ways can can actually help to reduce uh, uh, human error. Uh, but where you also have human beings overlooking the system and making sure that everything is operating well, you know, that, that what that does is beyond the economies of scale for the purposes of the banking institution, you also have, which hopefully will be passed on to the client, right, or to the customer. You also then have the automation, which which creates certain kinds of cost savings potentially for 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 the customer. But I think that again, a lot of the you know this is this is something that I think you know uh, 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 Brian Brooks should 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 like. I mean, you know, like, like at the end of the day, you need to have a a liquid customer market so that when they get into these predatory relationships, they can exit. And I think that part of the value proposition isn't just driving down the, the costs on the front end, but you're driving down the costs on the back end. And by driving down those costs on the back end, you're helping to facilitate a much more competitive market. And, and it's, it's, it's rethinking again, that, that whole suite of services um, and, and really thinking through the net economies and the, and the net costs and benefits in that uh, customer relationship, customer banking, sort of customer bank interface where you know we're not going to necessarily be chained to to Waffle House unless we are eating their hash browns. Aaron, just a couple of things. I mean, you know, first, I, I just say, I mean, I, I love the point about switching, and I would say, sort of ironically or maybe counterintuitively, I think ben banks would benefit if it was easier to switch bank accounts, because I think when people one reason people don't like their bank is they feel captive of their bank. And if they had a free opportunity to go to another bank, they would dislike their bank less. <laughs> so I, I think that has the potential actually to be a win-win. Um, on your AML point, I, I just want to point out how insidious and, and subtle some of this is. You know, when I talk to bank AML folks, I mean, if you think about what's the behavior of, of a money launderer, a lot of it is lots of cash deposits, generally small in size. So what's the behavior of an LMI person? It's lots of cash deposits, small in size. And so what happens is, and, and the, the, the examiners and the compliance folks don't admit de minimis exceptions, right? So what happens if you make a bunch of small cash deposits, the bank will call you up and say, what is the source of those funds? And maybe the source of those funds is undeclared tip income or piecework or whatever you did. And so people don't like it when their bank calls and asks them what the source of the funds are. And then by the way, they tell all their friends that if you bank at a bank, they're gonna call you and ask you where your money's coming from. And again, a lot of this could be solved by saying, you know what, somebody's depositing $200 a week is not, you know, at least not a successful drug dealer. Um, so, you know, maybe that'll take care of itself. But, you know, the, the way AML sort of permeates a lot of these issues around financial inclusion, I think is way understated. Um, and then just one last thing, and maybe partial answer to, to Mike and some, some Chris. When you think about the deposit account from the perspective of the bank and why I think some of them, you know, can still rely on overdraft fees, although I think Mike's study shows that you know the last five years it's been five percent of um, non-interest income for banks, so it's actually been fairly steady. But if you think about the bank relationship, you, know, you can't charge for a checking account. Everybody demands free checking, and the few banks that have tried to do that, their customers have hated them. They've been mocked, and they've had to was rescinded in hours. Right? You know, you're not currently earning a lot of net interest margin. You used to make money on interchange until the Durban price fixing amendment in Dodd Frank, you know, significantly reduced that. So, you know, part of the question is, you know, how can you make this a viable thing other than fees? Um, so I, I think that's sort of a, a common challenge we have. Around that. Margaret, I know you wanted to jump in. I want to. So, so I had one observation. I think a lot of this conversation today has been about, um, you know, large institutions and, and even the conversation, the Professor Brummer's point about, you know, economies of scale. And I think one of the things that it's important to to think about is you know sort of intended or unintended policy um, and kind of market structure co consequences of that um, you know because because I think that you know the I think everyone has spoken about the important you know including the um, the, the acting controller you know decent decentralization um, a diversity um, in the economy um, and, and I think that some of the things that we're talking about particularly in the technology space you know you've got to be um, concerned about whether 
you know, institutions and, you know, organizations of varying size and business model are going to be able to avail themselves, you know, of these tools, because you don't, you don't want to end up in a situation where you have just a handful of, um, you know, monoliths. Um, and, you know, I, I think even the, the large entities don't like that. Um, I think the the diversity is important, particularly, you know, for a country as large as ours. And when you think about the different types of communities, you um, and, and Brian has mentioned this before in, in terms of, you know, all the different consumer and customer preferences, you know, we need a diverse economy. We need a lot of different types of institutions, um, you know, meeting different needs. Um, and I think, uh, you know, to kind of bring this back to where we were, you know, a lot of what the, um, the OCC is talking about is, um, is for large established entities. Um, and so when you think about, you know, community banks um, in the banking space, or when you think about um, startups uh, in the non-bank fintech space, um, you know, the, the payments charter uh, is, you know, uh, which, you know, it counterfactually, given that we think it's illegal, you know, the payments charter is not for a startup or for a mid-sized company. Um, you know, that is what, those are the types of companies that the states are licensing and, and overseeing um, for consumer protection, BSA, AML, um, every day, now. Um, and maybe if I could just uh, take another moment, throw out a few data points too. Um, so, you know, in 2019, um, you had almost 100 companies acquire their first money transmission license ever um, uh, via NMLS, which is a technology platform that the states use uh, for non-bank licensing. Um, 67 of those entities were licensed in one state. Uh, but you also had 15 that were licensed in 10 or more, including three that are licensed in 30 or more. And, and so what you see is a, um, this is just one little snapshot of the diversity that the states um, are working with, um, you know, supporting and regulating every day, you know, today, now. Great. Well, with, with that, I think, Margaret, you're going to- is correct. That is, I think that's really uh, useful information, you know, to your economies of scale point. You're not only trying to uh, create economies of scale, but you also have to create customizable solutions. I know Greg sees that every single day and, and when he's talking to his members. And 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 I think that those observations that uh, Ms. Lewis made it were very useful. So you could see we could go on for quite a while. When you start talking about payments, you really start talking about everything because everything in this world requires payments. Uh, and, you know, the end of the month is coming up. Friday's July 31st. I know that date well. It's my daughter's 10th birthday. Uh, and if she gets uh, any birthday presents, they're not going to be available on, on August 1st. And for the millions of Americans who get a check on Friday, July 31st, and they have a, something's coming and due up, they're in a tough situation. There's no good reason that we're, we've, as a country, found ourselves decades behind the rest of the world. There's been some new innovation. Hopefully, we'll take more of that. Uh, and we'll continue these conversations on payments. I want to join and thank the rest of the panelists for spending some of their time, uh, hard-earned time and wisdom with us here at Brookings and uh, wish everybody a happy and health and safe uh, future. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.